So what I've done is I have some reaction. <clears throat> you, I know you guys haven't had kinetics, so you, you don't know a lot about reaction kinetics. But typically when you take kinetics, you're going to be interested in how a reaction rate depends on the concentration of the reactant, right? So um, if you have a reaction like some reactant A goes to B, you guys know about stoichiometry of reactions, right, already. But there'll be some rate, how fast this occurs. This matters a lot in chemical engineering, okay? And so a typical thing to assume is the rate of this reaction is equal to the stoichiometric coefficient, blah, blah. Let's just assume it's one. Some constant times the concentration of A. Right, so in other words, you're saying there's some rate of this reaction, and I think the rate of this reaction will increase linearly with the concentration of A. Double concentration of A, double the, the rate, okay? So this would be the simplest thing that you could presume might be true, okay? So what does this say? This says if I give you rate versus concentration data, it should fit a straight line. The slope should be the rate constant, and it, shouldn't have, it should have an intercept of zero, okay? Because if we have no reactant A, there's not gonna be any rate of reaction, <laughs> okay? All right, so maybe that's our expectation. Maybe you, you, know, you don't need to know this to do this example, but that's kind of the background of what we expect to get when we're done. All right, so there's the reactant concentration. So I did these experiments, right, somehow. I changed the reactant concentration in like a, a chemical reactor, and then I measured the rate that occurred. I'm not giving you units or anything. I'm just giving you numbers, okay? So I changed the reactant rate in eight different experiments for each experiment, uh, sorry, changed the concentration for each experiment, measured the rate, okay. Now, if you're a good engineer, the first thing you'll do is go into MATLAB, not Excel, okay? And you'll take this data and you'll plot it. Pretend there's no line there because that's the, that's the fit. And you'll plot the, the data points, the x's, and you'll look at it and see, think, does that look linear? That's what I would do at least. And I'd say, well, it looks pretty darn linear already. So I bet linear regression should work pretty well. And so now it's just brute force calculation, right? So obviously I know that you, most of you have calculators that can just do this with the data, but I'm showing you at least some of the steps involved in doing this, even though it's not very exciting. So first thing I do is calculate the sample mean, right? I take this data, sum up all these values, divide by eight, you get that number. Do the same thing with Y, sum all those numbers up, divide by eight, you get that number, okay? Now you've got X bar and Y bar. If you have X bar and Y bar, you can now go back and use these formulas, right? So if I have X bar and Y bar, I can calculate that thing, that thing, and that thing, because that's what they require. It's not fun. And you might imagine, I didn't do it. I did, I did it all in MATLAB, <laughs> but I'm pretending to do it. And if you pretended to do it, you would, now that you have your X bar, subtract that from all the values, sum them up, blah, 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 okay? And if you do that, you'll get those values there, okay? There's the, variance of x, there's the variance of y, there's the covariance. And now that I have these values, okay, I'm going to use this, right, I have the covariance and I have the variance of x, I can take the ratio to get k1. And now that I have k1, I can use this equation here to calculate k0. That's the way I did it. You don't have to do it that way. You could just use these formulas directly, um, where are they? Right here, if you wanted to, that one and that one. It's all the same amount of work, basically. Okay, but the variances and covariances are useful later for other things, so I calculated those now, okay? All right, so there they are. <coughs> there's the variance. X and Y, there's the covariance. I plugged it into the equation um, to get the, sorry, I keep flipping around. I know people hate this, but I can't help myself. All right, so there's the K1 value, just the ratio of those two, calculate the K0 value from that. You get, unless I made a mistake, you get those, okay? That's the slope, that's the intercept. So if you were in reaction kinetics class, you would say the following. Someone says, what, do, what is the rate constant for this reaction? You'd say 22.5, right? And that's a slope. That's what the slope should be, K, should be called K. Then I might ask you this question. How confident are you in that slope? How confident are you in that rate constant? 
Because you might imagine you're de designing a chemical reactor and someone's, to design a chemical reactor, you need to know this rate. It's critical, okay? So you do some experiments because you're going to build a pilot plant. And then you do some experiments, you tell some engineer that's the rate constant. Um, it, it's probably a reasonable thing to tell them how confident you are in that. Like, give some kind of confidence interval on this, which is what I'm going to do next. Like, it, how, how, how confident are you that the rate is actually this value? Uh, you know, the point is you can do linear regression with two points, right? If I give you two data points, you can draw a line and get a slope. Do you have any confidence in that? No, I have zero confidence in that. Right? The problem with data, of course, is data is noisy. So sometimes you get a value up here, sometimes down here. If you just take two lines, two points and draw a line, you can't have any confidence in that. So just reporting the value itself is not that useful. That's what I'm trying to argue. Second question that your fellow engineer might ask is, why is, what, why is the slope not zero? I mean, because no, no reactant. You're telling me if, um, if there's no reactant, the rate's actually negative, B makes A? You're like, well, that's not what I'm saying. <laughs> they say, what are you saying? And then you'd say, I'm just saying, so roughly how it would go. Um, so the idea is that, well, you don't really believe that, but that's what the data tells you, right? There's nothing about this regression that imposes any physical knowledge about this system, right? Like, you looked at the data and said it would fit a straight line, and luckily it did, but it, 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 the slope should really be zero. So then the, your fellow engineer might say, how confident are you that slope is not zero? You mean the y slope? Yeah, sorry. Y-intercept. How confident are you that number is not actually zero? Are you sure it's not zero? And the answer is, I'm not sure. In fact, I think it probably is, is really close to zero. <laughs> so what next thing I'm going to do is teach you how to calculate the confidence intervals on these things, OK? But so this calculation is, is um, just like baking a cake. Just take the formulas, plug the numbers in, that's it, OK? All right, so here's how to conf uh, calculate confidence intervals on slope. Um, I actually don't think I show you how to do it on the intercept, but I'll show you how to do it in MATLAB next time, next Wednesday. All right. So to calculate a confidence interval in linear regression, okay, let's just say for the slope at this point, you need some assumptions to do this, like always. Anytime we do these kind of calculations. So the first thing we're going to assume is the output y is not only random, we've already accepted it's random, it's normal. It's normally distributed. It follows a normal distribution. Okay, its mean depends on x in a linear way, okay, um, and the variance does not depend on x, okay. Now you might say, I don't see how this formula requires that, and the answer is of course you don't, but I'm just telling you that the derivation of these results, which you know in this class we don't derive these, we just use them, depends on that the variance is independent of x. So the mean depends on x, the independent variable, the variance is supposed to be independent of x, strictly speaking, for this test to work. Do you ever know this is true? No. Do you think it's true? Probably not. But you use the test anyway, because otherwise you can't come up with a test. It's just the way math works. All right? All right, so what you want to do is establish a confidence interval on the slope k1. So just to, sorry to do this to you, I know you despise me at this point. Um, you remember, kappa 1 is the true slope, kappa 0 is the true intercept. So we want to establish confidence intervals on kappa 1. In other words, what are we 95% confident that the real slope is in this range? OK? All right. So first thing you're going to do is specify the confidence level, like 90%, 95%, typical thing there that you have to do. Um, then you're going to calculate this quantity. OK, this is using the t distribution. So you're going to calculate 1 half 1 plus gamma, whatever gamma you choose. So if that's 0 0.95, this thing's going to be 0 0.975. And then you're going to calculate the degrees of freedom. For this particular test, it's n minus 2, number of samples minus 2. And then you're going to go look up in the table, try to find the c value, which of course in the table is called z, where f equals 0 0.975, for example, and has that degrees of freedom, and that will give you the value c that you're interested in. And I'll go through an example in a minute. All right. So now you have to perform this calculation here. The C value that you obtained is used in this formula here. But before you use that formula, you have to calculate this quantity. This is why I went ahead and calculated the variance of the samples. Because I, so I, you didn't have to use the variance. 
and the covariance to calculate the actual values, but you need them to calculate the confidence interval. So that's why I did it that way instead of using the other formulas. So you use this formula here. Okay, so it says take number of samples, that's n, these are the, the, variant, the co yeah, sorry, variances of y and x. That's the slope that you got from the linear regression squared. Okay, plug that stuff in, you'll get something called q0. Take the q0, plug it in this equation. Then you also need, again, the variance of x, and you need that critical value c that you pulled out of the table there. Then you get some k value, okay? And the way it works is that the upper limit is the slope that you calculated from linear regression minus k, and the upper limit is plus k, and then you're, you're, you have a gamma confidence level, like 95% confidence level, the true slope is in this range, okay? And this is actually really critical, because let's say, for example, you calculated a confidence interval and you said the slope is 3 and the lower limit was minus 1 and the upper limit was 7. You'd say, I don't even know if the slope's positive, <laughs> to be honest with you. Okay, so it's like full disclosure. So these confidence intervals are very useful. And so when you guys progress, you know, it's unfortunate that in this curriculum, or maybe it's standard, that you guys don't really get any real exposure to data until you're seniors, because that's when you first start doing lab. But when you do lab, um, and let's say you do linear regression in lab, you should calculate confidence intervals. If you calculate a mean and a variance, you should always calculate the confidence intervals on those. Okay. All right, so let's see how we use this, this idea here. All right, so it's the same problem I just showed you, which was the samples. Um, well, is this true? Let's see, where did, I, where did I, oh yeah, same problem. So we had N, eight experiments, so the degrees of freedom is N minus two, that ends up being six. Let's choose a confidence level of 95%. So again, that F of C value, which is 1 half 1 plus gamma is 0.975. So you look in the T table, I think it's t uh, A9, appendix A9. That value of F, that degrees of freedom, and you'll find that value of C. So again, when you, if you go over the notes at some point, like when you do the homework, just try to figure out how I got the value of C. You'll see it. But it's impossible to see if you don't have the table sitting in front of you. All right. So now we're going to use the formulas on the previous page. To use those formulas, we need to, first of all, calculate the variance and covariance. We already did that, right? There's the variance of x and y, and there's the covariance, and there's the k0, k0 that's the intercept, that's the slope. None of this is new. That's all done on the previous slide. So now I need to calculate the q0. Just to refresh your memory, that's the q0 there. And then I use that value of Q0 and the C here to calculate K, and that gives me the confidence interval. So the reason I'm just, you know, you might say this is entirely useless. The only reason I'm giving you these numbers is so you can go through the calculation yourself, and if something goes wrong, you can see where it went wrong. I'm, I'm not showing the calculations. I'm showing the result. So for this example, you get Q0 equal that. You get a K equal that. So the lower limit is this thing minus K, which is about 21 and the upper limit is that plus the big K, that's about 24. That means you're 95% confident the true slope's between 21 and 24. That's pretty good, I would say. That means you have a lot of confidence in what the slope is. That's to be, you understand, you could get the same mean, you could get a mean of 22.5 where the lower limit is 12.5 and the upper limit is 32.5. That'd be the same mean but you want to have much confidence in that particular value. So that's why the confidence intervals are important. All right? Um, I think in the book, but I don't remember, I have to admit, I think they show you how to co calculate a confidence interval on the intercept, but I don't show you, it's okay. Um, but I will, let me see, make sure. Um, I will show you how to do it in MATLAB, but for this particular question, you'd be interested in the following. Um, is so if you calculate a 95% confidence interval on the slope, okay, ha, I seem to have, I circle one thing and say another, okay. The intercept. You would like, because of what you know about reaction kinetics, we'll learn, you'd like, the, you'd like that the confidence interval for this slope to actually include zero, right? So if you calculated a 95% confidence interval on the intercept and you found it was, um, well, let me just write an example. And we'll do this, and we'll do it in MATLAB. 
And this addresses the question you might be asked, like, are you confident that slope is in that range? What, what is the number again? 1.15. I'm just making it up at this point, but let's just say it looks like this. So 1.15 minus, let's say, uh, so the, the true slope is called kappa zero. So what did I do? Two, and then this thing will be what? If I had a brain, uh, <laughs> I, I can take partial derivatives, but I can't add two to 1.15. It's not impressive. Um, is this right? It's supposed to be symmetric, whatever. So let's say you got a number that looked like this, okay? And then someone asks you, are you confident that the slope is not zero? Because I think it should be zero. The answer would be, you know, I think it could easily be zero because that's within this 95% confidence interval, okay? And so this is very useful because this tells you basically, don't believe the slope is any different than zero. Like if you have physical reason to believe it's zero, this gives you confidence in saying, I'll just, I'll just believe it's zero because statistically, zero is very reasonable. If zero was outside this confidence interval, that means you'd only have a 5% or less confidence level that it was outside and you, you'd think maybe the data's bad or something like that, okay? All right, and so what I did here is I just plotted this. So this was not hard to do. So the blue line is your regression line that was the one you got from the K, K1 and K0 you calculated for linear regression. Um, the X's are obviously the data. And then these other lines are for the 95% confidence level. So I plotted a line, the same line with the same intercept, but instead of, the slope, instead of that slope, I used that slope. And then I didn't made another line with that slope. Okay. And so this gives you a nice like pictorial of, so any data point that fell within this range would, would be considered within the 95% confidence interval. If you got some experiment that was way out here, that'd be pretty unprobable. Um, and so the idea is if you did this group of experiments and then some, when some colleague came in with a point like up there, you'd say, you probably did the experiment wrong. Um, <laughs> or something went, went wrong there. Okay. So that's um, linear regression. Now we're going to talk about correlation. Okay. So this is a different problem. So now you have two variables. Again, x, x and y. You get samples x1, y1, and so on. And now you assume they're both random variables. x and y are both random. And you want to see if there is a relationship between them. And in statistics, that means is, are they correlated to each other? In other words, if we increase x, does y tend to increase or decrease uniformly, right? Or is it just totally random? So, right, so it's not that, so if these were all deterministic variables, it'd be easy to de determine this, right? Because if these variables are deterministic and you changed x, y wouldn't change at all. It'd just be a flat line. You'd say they don't depend on each other. It's obvious. But if they're random variable, y will change just randomly. And then you've got to say, is that due to x or is that just due to random variation that had nothing to do with x at all? Okay, so that's what you're trying to do with this particular test. Again, we use this, um, the covariance, sample covariance, and the sample um, variances to calculate this thing. And I know you've seen this, it's called the correlation coefficient, right? So you take the covariance that I taught you, divide by uh, multiplying the two variances, you get something called R. R is guaranteed to be bounded below by minus one and bounded above by one, okay? And so when you, usually when your calculator gives you back a correlation coefficient, it just takes the absolute value of R, doesn't care about the sign. And you've learned, I'm sure, when you've done linear regression, that if R is near 1, then the data really looks like it falls on a straight line, and otherwise it doesn't, right? Um, and so I like this is in the book. This is nice, I think. It shows different. So this is X. This is Y, okay? These are a bunch of samples. And if you take these samples and calculate the mean, um, and the variances and the covariance, and then calculate the correlation coefficient. Data that looks like that will have a correlation coefficient of one. That's a no-brainer, right? I mean, yeah, it falls on a straight line. <laughs> it looks like it. So you get a correlation coefficient of one, okay? <clears throat> this one here you can see is not quite as clean, but it's still, you know, if someone asked you, does this follow a linear relationship? You'd say, yeah, with some noise. In other words, random variation, but yeah, it looks pretty linear, right? 
Then you start getting to cases like this, and someone would ask you, is there, does, does, um, is this fall in a straight line? The answer I hope you'd, you'd say is it doesn't look like it, okay? They, but then they might ask you a different question. Okay, it's not a straight line, but does X have any effect on Y at all? If you look at the data, you'd say, well, it looks like if X is higher, Y is higher. <laughs> it's not very precise, right? That's why you do correlation analysis. And then you see these values can also be negative. So this is a strong negative correlation. This is a very weak negative correlation. But again, here you'd say, if X is increased, it looks like Y tends to be smaller. But this is not a basis to draw a conclusion, right? Draw this data up here and goes, looks like it, right? <laughs> not very precise. Now here's a case where R is zero, okay? So when you calculate the correlation coefficient here, you get zero. That means for this data set, it appears, well, for the data set, but it appears the underlying relationship, there's no, X has no effect on Y. The only reason Y is varying is because Y has random variations in and of itself, so it has nothing to do with X at all, okay? So then the question is, when do you decide when to cut this off, right? Like that's none, that's complete. At what point do you start to say it doesn't? You can't wait till you get a correlation coefficient of absolute zero, because that'll never happen. So that's why we're going to do this kind of hypothesis test to determine this, okay? All right, so there again, there's your correlation coefficient calculated from the samples. Um, if the absolute value is one, it lines on a straight li line. If, the ab if it's zero, it's just completely uncorrelated with each other. Okay. All right. Now, as usual in statistics, there's a true correlation coefficient. Okay. That's calculated by using the true covariance and the true variances in this manner, and you get a true thing called rho. Okay. And again, if, if rho is equal to 1, then the true random variables x, y are linear related to according to this equation. If it's 0, then the true variables are not. Okay? And guess what? In statistics, our goal is to determine the true relationship from the samples. <laughs> Seems to be a recurring theme. All right? if, someone told, if, some, you know, if somebody gave us the, the real variance and covariances, we could just calculate this thing. We just say, that's the correlation, period. Okay, but since we have to do it from samples, that's why we're going to pose this thing as kind of a hypothesis test. So we already looked at this little picture here. So let's um, see how the test works. Okay, so this is a hy another hypothesis test. So the first thing we're assuming, we already assumed, is that X and Y are random variables. Okay, we're also going to assume, as usual, they're, ran they're normal. They follow a normal distribution. They're normally distributed random variables. Okay, our hypothesis is that they're uncorrelated. Okay, so we think the hypothesis is they're not, there's no correlation between the two of them. The alternative to this hypothesis is that they are correlated. Okay, so the, again, using this true correlation coefficient R, our hypothesis is the true correlation coefficient is zero. The alternative to that hypothesis is it's not zero, it's greater than zero. Or maybe the absolute value is greater than zero, I should have said. Okay, this is what we want to test. And then when we're done with the test, we'll come up with a conclusion based on the samples whether we think it's correlated or not. Okay? So first of all, as usual, choose the significance level. Right? Remember that? That's the chance that you'll uh, reject a true hypothesis. Typical value is 5 or 10%, something like that. Okay? Then you need to pick off this value of C out of the T distribution with this number of degrees of freedom. So w usually... Um, so, let me slow down here. So we're going to use the T distribution. We're going to calculate degrees of freedom as N minus 2, where N is the number of samples. We're going to calculate this quantity 1 minus alpha. So if alpha is 0.1, this will be 0.9. Because remember, the distribution just has numbers starting at 0.5 and going up. And so then we can, from this number here, you know, let's say 0.9, the degrees of freedom, whatever that is, we can pick off the value out of the table, which is called Z, but the critical value here we call C. It's just like we've done before. I'll show you an example and you can check it out later. All right. So now you've got this value C that you've obtained from the table. Then you perform this calculation. First of all, calculate the sample correlation coefficient. Right? So from the data you have, calculate as usual the variances of X and the variance of Y and also this covariance between X and Y, just using the formulas I showed you. And that's guaranteed to be in this range, obviously. And then plug it into this formula. Okay, so you've got the R there now. N is the number of samples. You divide by 1 minus R squared. That's, that's a um, calculated 
observed, they call this an observed value of t, okay? So what you're going to do is a, compare the observed value of t to the critical value of t, which is called c, to see if they're uncorrelated. And so if the value you calculate here, t, is less than this critical value c you obtained from the table, then you accept the hypothesis that they're uncorrelated. Otherwise, you reject the hypothesis, and then you assume they are correlated. Okay? So again, it's standard thing. Um, this, for this particular test, this is the um, hypothesis. This is the alternative. Uh, again, this should be not that it's necessarily greater than zero. The absolute value is greater than zero. Choose your significance level. Calculate your degrees of freedom. Get your C value. Calculate the variances and covariances, so on and so forth. All right? So let's see how this works. All right, so this, there's some background to this problem that um, I'll explain. So if you're making a polymer, okay, so how do you make polymer? Everyone knows what a polymer is. We've been through this, right? You ever, that's when you know you're getting old. You ask the same people the same questions all the time. Did I ever tell you about a polymer? You're like, well, let me see. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right, so a polymer is a long uh, chain of monomers connected together. And one of the critical things I've mentioned to you several times is the molecular weight of the polymer. How long are these chains? And supposedly, there's, well, there are things called chain transfer agents. What they do is they change, they ch don't change how much polymer you make. They're supposed to change just the molecular weight. Okay? So in other words, if you add hydrogen and you're making, let's say, polyethylene, Hydrogen is supposed to change the molecular weight. It'll make the chain smaller if you add more hydrogen. But it's not supposed to change the total amount of polymer you make. It'll just make the same amount of polymer with smaller chains, lower molecular weight. This is what it's supposed to do. So let's say you collected this data because someone said, I'm not so sure that hydrogen doesn't affect polymer, the polymerization rate, the amount of polymer made. So you collect this data, let's say in a pilot plant or lab scale. Change the hydrogen concentration, observe the polymerization rate, okay? And then you want to see, are these two things correlated or not with each other, all right? So if you look at the data, I think you'd agree, it's impossible to draw a conclusion. Well, of course, you can't draw a rigorous conclusion regardless, but there's no way to look at this and have any idea whether they are or not, at least to me, okay? All right. I can't even see a trend, but if you calculate um, the sample correlation coefficient for x, right, again, that's just the variance, sorry, ah. Calculate the variance for x, the variance for y, the covariance between x and y, and use that to calculate the correlation coefficient. You'll see there does appear to be a positive correlation between x and y, okay? But see, the problem with that number is that's from a finite number of samples, and you're not, that's not the true correlation coefficient. If that was the true one, you'd be done. You'd just say, yeah, there's a correlation. It's positive. They're correlated. The problem is now you don't have a lot of samples. You're not sure they're correlated. So that's why you do the hypothesis test, see if they actually are. Okay? So if you specify a significance level of 5%, okay, then you go back to the table. You, you, this is 0 0.95 here. This is, how many samples were there? Eight, sorry, eight. So this is six. So you look for six degrees of freedom, this T distribution having a value of 0.95, get the C value, and you can check this out. You'll see it's 1.94, okay? All right. So now what you do is to, um, Compute the t-statistic. So that's calculated like this. You take your correlation coefficient, which was a, what, 0.624. Use it here. This thing here is 8. You calculate this thing. It's 1.95, OK? And you compare that to c. Well, amazingly, c is 1.94. I didn't choose it this way. It's just the way it worked out. Bad luck for me, in a way. Um, well, so strictly speaking, t is greater than c, right? And if t is greater than c, you reject the hypothesis that they're uncorrelated. You actually think they are correlated, okay? It's very close, obviously, right? I mean, it's very close to drawing the other conclusion. If you calculated this thing and it was 0.193, you'd, you'd have concluded they're not correlated, but just the way it worked out, okay? 
So this is what the data looks like. Um, so all I've done here is plot the polymerization rate versus the hydrogen concentration. I'm not drawing a line. I'm not trying to fit this with any regression model. I'm just looking at the data seeing if I increase, because the, right, the correlation coefficient tells me there's some, there appears to be a positive correlation. If you increase the hydrogen concentration, there appears to be an increase in the polymerization rate. That is like not entirely clear to me by looking at this, but that's, that's what it says. Okay. And according to the test, given the number of samples we have and the significance level we want, we, we think that there is a correlation here, but just barely. Someone asked me the other day, um, maybe it was after class last time, they said something like, um, how do you, so this is your conclusion, okay, right? So someone said, how confident are you in your conclusion? I'd be like, no, nah, not a lot. <laughs> you know, because I kind of like, have a bad fuzzy feeling here, not a warm one. Like the t-value is so close to C, I'm, I'm wondering, my hypothesis seems, it's true, strictly speaking. But it, I'll show you in MATLAB, when you do these hypothesis tests, it gives you another statistic that is kind of a measure of how confident you are in your conclusion as well. I don't show you how to do that. But the idea here would be, if you were to do this in MATLAB, which I'll try to do next time we do MATLAB, um, you would conclude that although this is your conclusion, you're, you, you have a high level of lack of confidence in it. Do you have a question? No, just, just smiling at this. Okay, that's fine. Um, you never can have enough confidence about your own confidence. Yeah. I'm way overconfident about my confidence, okay? <laughs> I always tell my, because my wife's a lot different than me, she has like no confidence in her confidence. I'm like, it's always better to be overconfident and then be disappointed. You know what I mean? Like, of course I can do that. And then you can't, and you're just like, eh, screw it, right? <laughs> but if you go through life all the time, like, I can't do that. That's not gonna work. That's just too freaking hard, right? So I believe in just overconfident as much as possible. I suggest you try it. Even a little arrogance doesn't hurt, yeah. This particular hypothesis test is designed to test the fact that they're uncorrelated versus the alternative that they are correlated. But that's the only hypothesis test you'd want to perform. I mean, I guess you could do the opposite, that they're correlated versus the alternative, they're uncorrelated. But there's really no other, there's, you know, like the other tests we had like what, left-handed, right-handed, two-tailed, but for this, this is the only one that really makes any sense. So, yeah. Um, uh -huh. Well, there's no true sample correlation coefficient. There's the true one, and then the, um, yeah, there's the true. The true one, you don't calculate that. Yeah, okay, right. Will it give you a straight answer of zero or one? If, yeah, if you had an, if, if, the, if they were strictly uncorrelated and you could calculate the true correlation coefficient, if they weren't correlated, it would be zero. Not if they're uncorrelated. If they're, cor if, if they're slightly correlated, it'll be slightly different than one. The, the problem is, so we got a correlation of coefficient of 0.62, right? And that would lead you to believe that's pretty high level of correlation. Not linear, but it's correlated. The problem is it was only with eight samples, right? So if you got a correlation coefficient of 0.62 and you had 10,000 samples, you'd be essentially 100% sure they're correlated. But from eight samples, it's hard to know. But so strictly speaking, yeah, if you had a, an infinite number of samples and you could calculate